You're listening to the Gospel of Mark, a series preached by Pastor Dan Christians at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Father, Lord, I thank you for this morning that we can gather in your creation, that we can sing your praises. And God, as we sang, How Great Thou Art, I just thought about how great is the God who created all the trees around us and all the beauty we enjoy and who allowed us to be here and and fellowship together. And God, I pray that as we open your word this morning, that Christ would be honored, that we would come to your word with humble hearts, ready to receive what you have for us. Lord, I pray that the Spirit of God would take the feeble thoughts that I have and use them in the lives of your people um, for the glory and honor of Christ. We thank you, Lord, and we love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to begin this morning, we're going to be in just a few moments in Mark chapter 12. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there. The story this morning before us is a wonderful story. It is one about a woman who, by all accounts, from from the way that everybody around her would have seen her, she would have gone unnoticed. And if it was she was noticed, it would have been for some of the wrong reasons. And yet in our story, she is the hero. It's also a story about a group of men who, from all accounts, by everybody around them, would have looked at these men as their heroes, as their leaders, as the ones that they looked up to and they thought were so pious and holy. And yet from God's perspective, these men are the villains. They have wicked hearts. And so this message will be about how we serve and how our service is seen in the eyes of God. I want to set the context of our story with a brief recap of the events that lead up to our passage today. And the reason I want to do this is because it, it's been a while since we've been together in the book of Mark. And it's, it's difficult for me to jump right back in. And I can't imagine for, the, for you folks. And, and the way we like to preach is really that the context matters. And what happened before this helps us to understand what's happening right now. And so in Mark chapter 11, Passion Week begins. And Jesus arrives in Jerusalem to a parade of people shouting his praises. This does not make the religious leaders very happy. And so on Monday, Jesus walks into the temple, and to make matters worse, he decides it's the right time to flip over all the tables and to call this place has become a den of thieves. But it's not just your place to do whatever you want with it. This is my house, and it's meant to be a house of prayer for all nations. Again, that did not make the religious leaders happy. And so on Tuesday, when he arrives at the temple, they confront him. And they begin a series of confrontations where they're going to ask Jesus a question, expecting to trap him and make him look bad in front of the crowd. And the result is going to be that Jesus will answer the question in a way that silences his critics and makes Jesus look brilliant. And so the first question is about authority. And they say, Jesus, where is your authority from? And he says, "Um, I'm not going to tell you, but let me ask a question. Where did John the Baptist's authority come from? Well, they couldn't answer that question because it was from God. Hey, John said Jesus was the guy. He was the son of God. He was the one that that he had come to prepare the way for. But if they said of man, then the crowd would hate them because they really liked John. And so they are silenced and amazed. So they decide to try their shot a second time. And the next question is, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Jesus takes a coin and he says, what's on the coin? It's it's an image of Caesar. He says, well, render to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, the things that bear his image, and render to God those things that bear him his image, namely us, our lives. The next question is from the Sadducees, and they they come to him, and they're asking about the resurrection. And and really, they don't believe in the resurrection, but they want to make the resurrection look silly. So they ask a question, and and Jesus' response is, hey, you guys have two problems here. There's two reasons that you're very wrong about this. The first is you don't know the Bible. You don't know the scriptures. The second is you don't know the power of God. And so they've completely missed 
the truth of the resurrection, and again, they are silenced and amazed. And at this point, one of the scribes comes up to Jesus sincerely, and he has a real question. And so he asks a question about the law. Jesus, what are the most important commandments? And Jesus' response is, love God and love your neighbor. And the man, once again, is amazed, and he says, Jesus, you're right. And rather than Jesus saying, oh, thank you, that's really kind of you to say, he says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. In other words, you you know enough stuff. You know some things about God. You know some truth, but you're not there yet. And his problem is that he didn't understand that Jesus had come to be the Messiah, the king, but also to be the savior. He was the son of God who would die for his people. And and so the very next thing Jesus does is he begins to teach about David and how David called Jesus his son and his Lord. How is this possible? Because Christ is the son of God and the king, the, the Messiah that would come to sit on David's throne. And so he is step by step trying to teach the people who he is and why he's come. And I think this next story is, is helpful too. It also helps us to see the heart of Christ. And so we're going to begin our reading in Mark chapter 12, verse 38. And here Jesus is just about to lay into the scribes. And for the next three verses, he takes these men. And remember, the scribes would have been there listening. So imagine you have a crowd of people 10 times bigger than this crowd. And interspersed among the crowd, you have the scribes there listening and watching and and seeing, looking for opportunity to trap Jesus, to make him look bad. And Jesus begins laying into them. He lays bare for all to see the wickedness of their hearts and the cruelty of their actions. Verse 38. And he said unto them in his doctrine, beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts. Now, if you're thinking at this part, at this point, that this does not sound like a vicious condemnation, you just got to stick with me for a second because right now he is stating the obvious. He is, he is, stating what everybody else would have seen and known to be true. But what he's doing is he's revealing their motivations behind this. So the condemnation is veiled, but it is there. It's not necessarily just in their actions. It's in why they're doing what they're doing, which is really valuable for us because we must remember it's not just about what we do, but the heart behind what we do. He says they love. They love these things. They they matter so much more than they should to these these men. They love wearing their long clothing. And and this long clothing is referring to the flowing robes that they were to put on while they were in the synagogue. But here's the thing about the scribes. They would go in the synagogue. They'd put the robes on like they were supposed to. They, They were beautiful white robes that marked them as the leaders and the teachers. But they would not take them off when they were done. They kept them on. They wore them everywhere. Why? Because they wanted everybody to know who they were, how important they were. They were the leaders of the synagogue. They were the teachers of the Jewish people. They also love salutations in marketplaces. And you might think, yeah, they're just really friendly guys. But I don't think that's what he's talking about. When, When Jewish people saw one of their leaders, one of the religious leaders, the scribes, come toward them, they would actually get out of the way and in some cases, they would almost genuflect. They, they, would, they would kind of give passage and, and give this wonderful greeting to the Jewish leaders just to show the honor and respect that they thought they deserved. And then this is a kind thing for the folks to do. But the problem is the leaders, they loved it. They walked in there and they loved to see people stop what they're doing and and kind of bow down before them. They loved the attention and the respect and the honor that others would give to them. They also loved to sit in the best seats of the synagogue. And what they would do is they would take a bench and they'd put the bench at the front of the synagogue and line up the, the scribes so that they would sit across from the rest of the people. 
So that the whole time they're there learning about God and worshiping God, they're also looking at the scribes. And this is ironic because I, I remember growing up in churches where all of the pastors or all of the guest speakers would all sit at the front of the service in these beautiful big chairs for the entire service. And it was always weird. Like you'd see the one guy, he's up here preaching, and then you'd have an entourage of men sitting behind him just telling the crowd how important they are. That's what these guys loved. And I'm not saying everybody that sat behind there did it for evil motives. But what I am saying is Jesus was pointing out the fact that they wanted everybody to see them, right? When they went to a feast, they wanted the, the spots of honor. They wanted to sit at the right hand and the left hand of the host. They wanted to be honored everywhere. That Do you see the heart that they had? And so this heart of wanting to be exalted and elevated drove them to what happens in verse 40. Can't turn my page. So here, I, th- I think Jesus here is just brilliant because the way he does this is he, he shows them what happens all the time. He reveals the heart behind it. And then he says, here's the end of it. Verse 40, which devour widows' houses. And for a pretense, make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. In that day, the widows were incredibly vulnerable in that society. They were completely dependent on before on their husbands for income. And so when their husband was gone, they had very little opportunity for employment very little ability to make any any money and and sustain themselves. And so they would try and live on the generosity of family and friends and on what was left. And it was a very difficult position for them to be in. There was certainly no social network that kind of caught them. The Roman government was not helping Jewish widows. And And it should have been left to the leaders of Israel to step in, to surround them, and to to care for those who were vulnerable and in need. But that is not what they did. They would, and we don't know exactly how this all happened, but I I do believe the next few verses give us an idea. I think they were so obsessed with exalting themselves that they would guilt and manipulate these widows into giving the little they had over to the temple, to them as gifts. And ultimately, they were left with absolutely nothing. It's a really terrible thing. It's really, it's really, it's a really horrible story. And, and these are the things that happen in religions, in in churches even, that make the world around us rightfully disdain the church, right? When they see vulnerable people taking advantage of, it's sickening. We should all hate that. We should all want to fight against that. And these guys were doing it and everybody thought it was okay. And then it says for pretense, they were making long prayers. It's almost like They're sitting there with these long, beautiful, eloquent prayers, having everybody think how wonderful they are. And meanwhile, they're taking the last loaf of bread from these widows. It's disgusting. But I like the end of that verse. These shall receive greater damnation. It's not just damnation that they're going to get. It's going to be really great. Uh, maybe I'm sick. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then someone different shows up. Verse 41, we have the Jesus begin to talk about what's happening in front of them immediately after he's speaking. And I think Mark records these stories back to back for a reason. He says, and Jesus sat over against the treasury And he beheld, he was watching how the people cast money into the treasury and how many that were rich cast in much. So Jesus, he's this people watcher. What I think is really neat to think about. Jesus is sitting there off the side. Nobody really is paying attention to him at this point. He's just watching people as they come to the treasury and they cast in money. And and back then they would have had 12... uh, treasuries, 12 places that you could put money in, and it was they were brass, and they were shaped like an inverted horn. And so when people would throw money in them, because they're made of brass, they would make a bunch of noise. 
right? And the more money you threw, the more coins you threw, the louder it would be. And so you have these 13 basins, these brass holders, and each of them were for something different. Kind of like when you give money to the church, you have different funds that you give to. And so they would choose which funds they'd go up. And, and as people were there and watching, especially during the feast days, which we were just coming up to the Passover, it would have been incredibly busy in the temple. And people have come from far and wide to give money to the temple. And so the person after person goes up and Jesus watches these rich people unload bagfuls of money and dump them. And, and, and all the clinking and clanking and the racket that would have been made as they give their money. And then we have a different person show up. Verse 42 says, there came a certain poor woman, a poor widow. She threw in two mites, which make a farthing. Again, imagine this widow. We know she's poor, not only because she's a widow, and and most widows were poor, but because she probably had clothing that was worn and tattered. And in her hand, she holds two mites. These are the smallest coins in circulation in Palestine. They would have been the value of about 1 64th of a day's work for a common laborer, which would have been equivalent to a dollar or two in our day. And so it's interesting to me that he makes the point to say she had two mites which equal a farthing. She didn't just have a farthing where that's all she had to give. She could have kept one of those mites for herself. But instead, this widow walks up, and as she unloads her coins into the treasury, there's almost silence. Maybe one tiny clink in the bottom. After all these people have unloaded bags of money, and she comes in and she gives what seems to be almost nothing. And then, just as quietly as she came, she turns around and she leaves. And if anybody there had noticed her, they may have chuckled. Why did she even show up? What's the point of making this journey and coming all the way here just for that little bit, a couple bucks? Why do it? If they knew how little she gave, they would have, they would have laughed at her. And here, there is at least one person who does notice her, and that's Jesus. And we see her and her gift through the eyes of Christ in verse 43. And he called to him his disciples and said unto him, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow has cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. What an amazing story. What an incredible thing that there's this like woman who nobody would ever know about. Nobody would ever notice. And yet... Jesus takes a portion of his holy word to tell us about this woman who gave almost nothing because he wants us to know that to him, her gift meant more than all the rest of the money that was given. Thousands of dollars is being collected. People are coming from far and wide to give their bags of money. And Jesus says that what this woman gave was more valuable to him than all of that. Why? Because she gave out of her want. Because she sacrificed. Because for her to give, it demonstrated that she had a heart that had love for her God. That had incredible faith and dependence upon him. And others came and they gave and they gave out of their abundance. They had so much and it was easy for them. It cost them nothing even to give a whole lot. But it cost her all of her living. It's all that she had left. She didn't go grab lunch. She gave it. And so I hope that this morning, 
as we look to the word of God and we see this story and we see these two contrasting figures, the picture of the religious person who has it all together, who's wealthy and, and revered by the people around him, and the way Jesus looked at that person. And then we see this widow who wasn't being taken care of very well by those who should take care of him, but she still came and gave God all that she had. And hopefully we can learn some wonderful lessons. And so the first thing I want us to see this morning is that there is an attitude about giving and serving that Jesus hates. It's possible to do some of the right things for the wrong reasons. And when you do that, Jesus is not impressed. It'd be better if he just didn't show up. He, we look at the pretentious clothing of the scribes, their ostentatious public greetings, their desire to be adored by the crowds, their pompous seats in front of the synagogues over and above everybody else, their arrogance in their desire to always get, be given the, the seat of honor at feasts. We see the way they robbed widows of their homes while praying these super long prayers so that people would see just how spiritual they really are. And Jesus hates that. He hates that hypocrisy. He hates the self-promotion. He hates the wicked pride that turns servants into God until, into idols who demand to be worshipped. And really, that was the problem that the scribes, that the religious leaders had with Jesus. It wasn't that they were saying, no, there's a different way to worship God. Jesus had his way and they had their way. It was that they wanted to be worshipped like God. And Jesus said, that's not okay. You don't have that authority. You don't deserve that worship. And I, I think it's important for us to realize that this is not a Jewish problem. It's not a first century problem. This is a problem with all humanity. You take any group of people and you will find this heart, this self-promoting, prideful, desire for power kind of heart. We see it in the world all the time, but sadly, we also see it in the churches. I have just finished, at least to this point, listening to uh, a podcast about the rise and fall of Mars Hill Church. And if you don't know about the church, it's a church that grew very quickly on the back of one personality, one man uh, who was a brilliant man, uh, a smart teacher, uh, taught a lot of good things but was filled with pride and arrogance. And that church fell so much more quickly than it grew. And it grew fast. And, and the problem here is we have people, we have believers who want to, they want to worship. In a sense, they want to worship their leaders. They're willing to lift them up onto pedestals that they ought not be on. Now, I don't want you to get this wrong. I don't want, I know the Bible talks about give honor to whom honor is due. And there is a, a, a place of honor for those who teach you the word of God and, and, and pastor you and shepherd you. I, I think that's right. But it's honor. It's not worship. And those things are different, right? We all are under the same Lord. We all need to be shepherded. We all make mistakes and fail. And, and if you are going to worship a religious leader as your Lord, you will be disappointed and it will be very painful when you are. But not only that, you're doing a disservice to that person, lifting them up like that. Nobody ought to be lifted up like that. And as soon as we lift anybody up like that, it's trouble for them. I don't know many men and women who could be lifted up and put on a pedestal and lauded all the time and not be impacted. It's a dangerous place to be. And so this attitude has and continues to affect Christendom. We've seen it through the centuries of the church. We see it clearly in the North American church today. And the problem here is in their hearts, in our hearts, in my heart. The desire for honor, for approval, for status, for recognition, for appreciation, for influence. That's not only in the heart of a pastor. That's in, I would guess, all of your hearts. 
all of us. We want to be lifted up. We want to be seen and appreciated. And we, we just want people to notice. Have you ever done something for somebody else and then kind of looked over your shoulder to make sure somebody else was watching? It happens, right? And that's this heart that Jesus hates. The second thing I want us to notice today is that I believe there is a system in place here that Jesus hates. And what I mean by that is there is a system that guilted, that made this poor widow give her last two coins to the temple treasury instead of buying herself a meal. And you might say, yeah, but Jesus thought what she did was amazing. I think what she did was amazing too. I think it was wonderful. But I do not think that it was right for anybody to make her feel like she needed to do that. She had two mites left, and I think it would be appropriate for her to buy some food. And so please help, help me as I try and separate these two things from the system that manipulated and guilted the woman into giving beyond what she could. And the woman who had this wonderful heart to serve God in any way she possibly could. And, and I guess what I'm saying to you is, if, if you're in a situation where you don't have anything, you don't have any money, and, and it's, it's food or giving money to the church, I would encourage you to go get some food. Okay? And as God blesses you, and as you have abundance, then give. Give joyfully. But I don't think there should be systems. And, and part of the reason I say that is because here's where I see this system in place today. The prosperity gospel movement. The word of faith movement. What is that doing to people? If you have enough faith, then send us money and God will bless you tenfold, a hundredfold even. I, I know that you might be struggling this week, but put it on your credit card. You can do it. Send us $2,000 and I, I guarantee you'll get X number of dollars in the future. And people do it. And, and this is the, the version of Christianity that not only is growing in North America, but it's being exported to places like Africa and South America and Central America. And what an awful thing that is. Taking people who have nothing and telling them they have to give it all to, to the leaders. And then you have the leadership who is using that money to buy mansions and planes. And it's disgusting. And I think that is a system that Jesus would hate. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, God is very concerned with taking care of the vulnerable in our society. So many laws in the book of Deuteronomy deal with the fatherless, the widow, and the stranger. Over and over again, those three words come up. And at every point, God is encouraging people to love them and care for them and meet their needs. Because God loves them. And he would hate that these people are being taken advantage of. Even in the New Testament, James 1.27, James writes that pure religion that is undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widow in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Do you want to know how to do religion right? It's to take care of people who need to be taken care of. To take care of the vulnerable, the fatherless and the widow. And we are reminded in this text that those who do take advantage of them will be judged accordingly. So I'm not saying it's wrong to give. I'm not even saying that it's wrong to give sacrificially. I think it's right to do so. I know that David said he wouldn't give a gift if it didn't cost him anything. And so when we give, it should hurt a little bit. But I am saying it's wrong to manipulate people into giving what they cannot afford and then to falsely promise God's blessing in return. So there's a system that God hates. Finally, there is a heart that Jesus applauds. And I want to conclude our service thinking about what the heart looks like that Jesus applauds. This is the heart of the poor widow who is full of faith. And maybe she was manipulated into giving this money. Maybe when they were talking about the, fair, the scribes devouring widows' houses, this is what they meant. That they're manipulating them and they're guilting them into giving what they don't have. 
But regardless of what got her to this point, her heart was right. She was full of love and full of faith and full of dependence upon God. She was willing to sacrifice. She was willing to place her next meal in God's hands rather than keeping it in her own. I I thought as this woman gives us money, when she prays, prays the prayer, Lord, give me this day my daily bread. It would have meant something very different than it means when we say it. Literally, Lord, help me have something to eat today. And Jesus was blessed by her generous heart. He drew attention to it. To him, this gift and this sacrifice meant more than the copious amounts of money that were given by the rich. Two years ago, we were in Florida and we went on, we were on vacation there. And on our way back, our family stopped in Cincinnati, Ohio. And we stayed downtown in a hotel And we went out and we walked around uh, downtown for a little while. There was a skating rink set up and that was kind of cool to watch. And there were some places to get hot chocolate and and stuff. And and so we we enjoyed our time as our family. And on our way back to the hotel, we walked past a man who was homeless. And, uh, you know, the man's got his cup out and he kind of looks at you and I just continued to walk along and, and our family continued. And then we got in front of our hotel about 20 steps later and and I remember Miles pulled me aside. I think all the, the boys were kind of interested in this, but Miles pulled me aside and said, what's, what's wrong with that man? And I said, I think he's homeless. And he said, well, what, what is he doing? And I said, he's asking for money. And when I looked at the man, to be honest with you, I think I, think I knew what the money was for. Uh, I, I, I didn't think he was going to spend that money to better his life or to get a place to stay or to grab a bite to eat. I think I knew what he wanted to do with the money. And so I walked past, but the boys, they saw this and they were touched. They were moved. And so they, they took the last little bit of money that they had from their vacation and they went back to this man and they put it in the man's cup. Now I I could have taken the opportunity to explain why it was a bad idea to give to people who are homeless and drunk on the street. I could have done that. And I could have taught them that you shouldn't give, you know, when God leads you to give because it might be used for the wrong reasons. But I I really think that part of what this story is doing is it's teaching us that when God moves us to give, when there's a need or something that we can meet, it's okay for us to meet it. It's a good thing for us to give when we feel prompted to give. And even in this situation where I think that that this woman was, in a sense, manipulated into giving this gift... She was still honored by God, even though it was going to a temple that would soon be torn down to leaders who probably already had too much. It was still good for her to give because she was giving it to God. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is when we are living, when we're, when we're determining what we're going to give our money to and, and who we're going to bless, and what, I think and maybe this is for me and nobody else, but I think sometimes we try and think so hard and make sure that every single dollar is going to go into all the right things every time. And I, I do think we should exercise wisdom and discernment, but I don't know if sometimes we're just clenching our money too tightly with the idea that someday there's going to be the right person. If, if there's somebody in our church that you think might need something, then give it to them. And if they, if they end up spending that money on cable TV, so be it. Be generous, right? Give as God has given you. Give joyfully. Take care of needs. Love on people. We certainly don't want a system that squeezes the final dollars out of widows' bank accounts. But we do want to be believers who, like this widow, are ready to give sacrificially out of love. God saw her heart. He saw the way that she served. That she was serving not so anybody could see. In fact, she probably came very humbly and left very quickly. But he was so pleased with the way that she give, gave because of the faith and the love behind it. And Jesus saw all of these men who were standing in the crowd. Everybody knew who they were because of the robes they were wearing. Everybody knew to genuflect when they came because that's how you honored them. And these people, they just loved it. They loved the attention. And he knew their hearts. And he was planning to judge them for it. 
And so what a great opportunity that's before us today as we look at how we serve our Savior. Do we serve Christ because we want others to notice? Do we give but before it hurts? Or do we love Christ and trust him and do what we do because we want to please him and no one else? Are we living before an audience of one? Or is what we do all about how we're, we're seen by others? Our story today flips the world of Jesus' day on its head. The widow is commended because she gave the little she had, and the pious and wealthy religious leaders are condemned for their desiring attention and their pride and their need for recognition. We looked at a verse in 1 Peter in our last study, and this text just reminded me so much of that. It said in 1 Peter 5, 5, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. And I thought about the clothing that this woman was wearing, how it would have just represented humility. For God resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Can I remind you this morning that we don't give and we don't serve so that God will be impressed with us. We don't give and we don't serve to merit his favor. That everything that we need for forgiveness has been taken care of for us on the cross. That when Christ died for us, he said it is finished. And so we are saved by his blood and by his blood alone. If you don't know Christ today, you, you, that's, I mean, more than anything I've said, what you need to know is that Christ came and he died for your sins so that you could know him and be with him forever. But if you know that grace, if you've received the unmerited favor of God, then the right response to that is to love him, to trust him, and to serve him with what he's given us. And so may we leave this morning with the desire to be like this woman. Check our pride and then live in love and faith and obedience. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this story. Lord, I thank you for such a clear contrast that we look to this woman who so many would have seen as unimportant, as, as they've seen little value in her, and yet through your eyes, what she gave was more valuable than anything else that was there because she gave with a heart of faith and of love and a desire to serve her God. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be people who love you and who want to please you. And it's not about everybody around us. Lord, help us to give and to serve and to, to love out of just an overflow of the grace that you've given to us so freely in Christ. Lord, I, I pray that we would live our lives for the honor and glory of Christ and never for our own glory. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. And thank you for sending your son. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.